everybody and welcome to this masterclass on private wealth and private client work. I'm delighted to be running this session for you and I hope that you'll find this masterclass informative and get involved with the conversation by submitting your questions throughout. Before handing over to my colleague Liv and the panelists, the first thing I want to do is set out the aims of this masterclass. So by the end of this masterclass, you should understand exactly what private wealth and private client work is, have a clear idea of what it is a private client solicitor does, and feel confident in knowing how to break into and succeed within this practice area. We'll come back to those aims in just a moment, but before we kick off with our panelists, I wanted to go over some house rules. First and foremost, please use the online question tool to pose any questions to the speakers that you have, and Liv will be posing them to the panelists throughout the presentation. But the earlier you send in your questions, the more likely they are to be answered. We always have people sending them in within the last 30 seconds, and we probably aren't going to have time to get to you if you do that. Uh, the next thing is that please note this masterclass is being recorded and a recording of the session will be sent to all registrants after the session and will be available on our YouTube channel very shortly too. And finally, please feel free to post about the masterclass on social media using hashtag LCN masterclass. So before we kick off, the first thing I'm going to do is ask you all what stage you are at. So there should be a poll coming up on your screens. And if you can fill that in to let us know where you're coming from today, and that just helps our speakers tailor their answers a bit more to you and your journey. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So we've got a lot of second and third years, quite a few postgraduates or in work, which is really, really interesting. Some non-law students and some first year students. So good for you guys on joining us today. OK, well, thank you very much for filling that out. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Liv and the panellists. Over to you all. Perfect. Can everybody hear me? Yes, perfect. Um, so hello, everybody. Welcome to the webinar today. Um, this hour always goes so far, so I think we'll just jump straight in. So um, before we get to, uh, started on the questions, I'm just going to get all of our panellists to introduce themselves. Um, so, Ed, if we start with you. Sure. So, um, my name is Ed Hayes. I'm at Burgess Salmon, so headquartered in Bristol, but working in kind of London and Bristol. Um, I, a bit of background, I studied law. I then did law school. I trained at one of the city firms, um, we spent three years there, and then in 2016, moved over to Bristol and to Burgess Salmon, and now I'm a director in the team. We call it tax, trust and private wealth, but it's basically private client. Um, and the director is kind of the equivalent of a salaried partner type role. Brilliant, thank you. And Michael? Uh, everyone, I'm Michael Conway. I'm from Mumble One Dickinson and I'm an associate there um, in our private capital team. Um, I'm six years qualified. A bit of background about me, I did a classics degree rather than a law degree um, and then did a conversion and um, then did the solicitor exams. Uh, I trained in a small, relatively small high street firm and then um, had a year, about a year in Sirencester when I qualified and then I moved to WBD in 2019. Brilliant, thank you. And Alex? Hi everyone, uh, I'm Alex Southall. I'm a trainee solicitor at Mitchell Moores. I'm currently sitting in my first seat in our agricultural property team, which sits within our wider private client group. Um, so just a bit of background on that, because it's maybe not what you'd expect from sort of your more classic private wealth seats. Uh, it's quite a varied seat, including um, work on family farm partnership structures, agricultural property disputes, um, some environmental work, um, to name a few, and a bit of background about me. Before I got to Mitchell Moores, I studied history at university and then undertook my two years of law conversion and started in September. Brilliant, thank you everybody. Um, and Alex, just to stick with you, I guess the, the most obvious first question is, uh, what is private wealth? What do lawyers mean when they refer um, to private wealth? Sure, yeah, so I think um, private wealth in a legal context kind of refers to work that's done for private individuals in relation to their sort of their wealth and their assets. Um, so that can be wealth management, um, work to do with wills, trusts and probate um, and family matters 
as well as private property for sort of larger private estates. Perfect. And we'll uh, likely expand on some of those a little bit later on in the masterclass as well. Um, Michael, just coming uh, to you next, is private wealth a specific practice area or is it um, sort of like is it a sub specialization? Yeah, so it's probably building a bit on what Alex already said as well. But I, I tend to see private wealth as a business group as a whole. Um, and then often within those, you then have your sub specialisms, which can get quite heavily narrowed down. So obviously earlier I said I'm part of our private capital team, which tends to deal with more sort of tr your traditional, what you might associate with a private client, lawyer, wills, trust, trust tax, succession planning, those sorts of things. But then sitting within the private wealth business group, you have, we have a charities team, we have an agricultural farm estates team. So it is, it is a broad area in itself, private wealth, and then you look to narrow down and then on. What, what what you're doing really and um and then ed how would you how do you say how would you say private wealth kind of fits into other uh tax areas as well yeah i think there's you can say that question in two ways and one is how it fits in for the firms and we'll come to this bit later but um you know private wealth in some firms is kind of all the firm does and if it's a more boutique -y kind of private client practice and for other firms it's uh part of it's one of many different areas that they practice in and actually I think that private wealth is very different to lots of practice areas so in you know I'm Bird of Salmon's a full service law firm my day-to-day -day experience as a lawyer is so different to the day-to-day -day experience of someone working in our projects team or you know our corporate real estate team that kind of thing um, and I think that's really important for people who are thinking of it as a practice area uh, just to be aware of because if you go to a law firm and you go on a vacation day or an open day or whatever it is um, I think actually a lot of the tr more transactional departments or the more kind of commercial for want of a better word departments you can get quite a good feel for lots of them from being in just one was actually I think the private wealth teams because our client base are individuals and the structures that serve individuals rather than usually big corporates um it's got a very very different feel so do be aware that it's quite I think it's quite a unique um type of law to practice and then from the businesses standpoint it absolutely um, echo what Alex and Michael were saying about it, I think it's helpful to think of it as you've got private client is you or some variation of that phrase is usually what firms call the department that specializes in tax and trusts and estate planning work and most people in that department will do tax advice and you know wills and probate and all and that kind of thing and private wealth is usually used to refer to the broader as, as Michael put it, the, the business grouping which is actually all the other bits of your firm that might be relevant to those clients but isn't specifically kind of individual stuff so in our private wealth team you've got the high-end residential property team you've got the banking and finance guys that help on you know uh, family businesses that kind of thing and to give you an idea of the, the difference in scale the tax trust and family team in Burdesan, which is our equivalent of a private client department is about 45 lawyers our private wealth team is over 100 because you've got all these different people from other bits of the firm that kind of bring in so private wealth is a bigger term than than private client i think is the key point i'm trying to get across there Brilliant, thank you. And just to stick with you there, you mentioned the scale of private wealth at Burgess Salmon. How would you say, um, I imagine that they're kind of the size of uh, these teams differ at different firms, but do you have any kind of insights into that? Yeah, it's, it, it's really variable. Actually, and one question that's coming later, I think, is about the types of firm that do this work. And, you know, Michael's experience there, when he said he came from a smaller firm, his experience at that smaller firm will be very different to his experience now at, at Wombles. Um, and when you're choosing a, a practice area it, you are ideally you're trying to choose the combination of practice area and law firm because I, I used to practice at McFarlane's in London and the, the type of work I did there wasn't enormously dissimilar to what I now do at Bird of Salmon but my own experience was very very different because of course the expectations between the two are very different and the deal that that firm offers you is, is very very different and there's real pros and real cons to all of this and I don't think in you know, any firm that tries to convince you like we're the the best firm they're just not they're, they're all they all have advantages and disadvantages and for some people they'll be the best firm and a key part of choosing the right um firm is understanding exactly what they're offering and what you want from it and I think private wealth has a number of really you know 
we're all biased to some extent at least alex you've got an option so you don't have to commit to, to yeah. private wealth you can go somewhere else but michael and i are kind of committed into it um and i've never regretted that i've always thought private wealth is a fascinating area because it's all the interesting bits of law with the interesting bits of people and when i pick up a new file i pick up a family tree and the life history of a bunch of people then how they interact rather than a set of accounts and some board minutes and for me personally i find that more interesting now some of my banking colleagues would look at my work and go what well, this is this isn't exciting this is never on the front page of the ft you know why why do you care and so it really is kind of personal preference as to what you're um, what you're doing and the different sizes of firm will have very different sizes of private wealth team and very different levels of importance and again it's the thing you know do you want to work in a private wealth team which is central to your your firm's like outlook and, and brand or do you want to work in a private wealth team which is part of a bigger firm but actually might not have as much kind of internal clout and these are all questions for for the people on this call just to think about when they're weighing up you know where do i want to apply and, and what might i want to practice thank you i think that's really useful as well and, and useful for them to have those answers for interviews and applications and things like that as well we'll come on to some of the other kind of factors as well that i think um they should be considering later on in the masterclass too. Alex, just to jump back to you, um, as a trainee, can you um, outline what you might be doing kind of day to day um, in, the, in the private wealth team? Sure, yes. In terms of what I do in particular in the agriculture property team, um, it might be sitting in on meetings and taking attendance notes with clients to initially work out what their particular issue is or what advice they need. Um, and kind of following on from that then it might be drafting legal documents um, so like property documents or uh, other private wealth tra trainees may have a go at drafting sort of wills and lasting powers of attorney um, quite a lot of drafting correspondence as well so i sit in a contentious seat um, so i'm doing litigation and you might be sort of drafting correspondence to the other side or liaising with other um, legal professionals or experts um, and yeah sort of updating clients as well throughout their matters um, they, you might be their first point of contact um, sort of explaining legal concepts to them or updating them on sort of where their matter is brilliant thank you and then Michael how would you say this kind of changes as you as you progress in terms of the types of work the type of work you're getting involved with the things you're doing day to day yeah I, I, it's quite an interesting question and I suppose thinking about it just on this panel obviously we've got a range of positions starting from trainee to associate to director and so um, I think what's what's particularly noticeable in how work will change is one a reflection of your experience um, but also just a commercial reality as well of higher hourly rates and there's an element of delegation to being to producing the most cost effective um, work for clients whilst also factoring in supervision so i think like alex saying at the beginning you fully expect to be sort of going to meetings with someone more senior taking attendance notes building your knowledge in that way from there you'd obviously then be getting involved in lots of the drafting i think as you progress there'll be you take on more responsibility naturally um, and you start to build your own workload your own files that's not to say that you know even me even me now as six years qualified and associate i'm not whilst i have my own my own workload you're not suddenly sort of left <laughs> to go go just go on your own you're still always getting more knowledge from you know, more senior people. Um, but I think what then really, and I'm sure Ed would probably <laughs> be the best to say on this, but I think what then becomes really clear is actually you probably find as you get near the top in director partner territory, you're actually one response, your responsibilities change to be more about bringing in work and delegating work and also being the sort of the face for the client because they they see you as your as the reason they they're out the firm, but then the actual work is being delegated down, which kind of ties back to what I was saying about hourly rates. Then I don't know if you roughly agree with agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think the helpful way of conceptualising it is that when you start out in any private wealth seat, and they are all a bit different you know, if you're an agricultural property or disputes versus you know, probate or whatever you're doing, but fundamentally, when you start out, 
you're you're given someone else decides what work needs to be done and someone else says to you i need you to do this specific task and you're usually given quite strict guidelines and you draft this document to achieve this thing and so you're focused on one part of a matter and the time scales are all different at different firms and in different areas but fundamentally you gradually move from that to you're deciding not only how to do a particular task but you're deciding you're helping decide what tasks need to be done on a matter and increasingly managing communication with clients i mean alex is already doing that as a trainee he said there and, and you'll do that more and more as you, as you get more senior until you get to a point where actually you're making a lot of the, the at least the day-to-day -day calls on a file you're still not usually doing the strategic big picture stuff but you know when you're kind of michael's level things you, you will be doing making a lot of decisions on on files rather than just doing what someone else has asked you to do and then michael's exactly right that once you kind of get a little bit beyond where michael is increasingly this other part of your a big factor in your kind of working week is right where are we getting work from and so there's increasingly you know if i look at my week just now i spent two days in london monday and tuesday most of my time in london was spent running around between various different people's offices meeting clients meeting intermediaries um, maintaining relationships and doing frankly very little actual kind of legal work other than responding to emails from my junior lawyers who said oh is this right do i do that what well, that kind of thing having the odd call with someone to say do you mind looking into this point of law because i've got a meeting about it tomorrow and i can't quite remember how that works that kind of thing um and it's something that i think i think it's a seat where the, what you're doing changes quite a lot as you get more um senior again as a comparison point some other areas of law are actually particularly those areas of law which are quite heavily kind of project management early on where what you do as a trainee is very similar to what you might do as a one-year qualified or a two-year qualified I think what you do as a trainee in private wealth is often very different to what you do even to one year two year qualified and what you do as a one year two year qualified is really quite different to what you do as a five year six year qualified and that's partly because it's so technical and you know I'm I'm now probably coming up to about 11 years qualified and I am very aware there are massive areas that I have limited experience of or that you know I need to double check on things because what we cover is so broad whereas I don't think my wife would feel me, I was casting expressions, but she's an employment lawyer. She has a smaller pool of actual technical law to learn, and a lot more of her job is kind of the practice of how do you apply that. Now we do a lot of practical application, but we do a huge amount of actually just you know, going into case law and things in different technical areas. And those are, um, I think, you've got to like the technical side to enjoy what we do. But yeah, the role does change quite a lot um, over the course of a career. I think all things to consider as well, the differences between practice areas too, good questions to ask. So for those watching, make sure you're jotting these things down because they're great questions to ask when you're networking um, and meeting firms. Um, and just kind of while we're on um, talking about clients um, and things like that, Michael, um, one of my questions, and I've just seen someone else um, from the audience ask it as well, um, is what type of clients do you work with? Um, can you ex um, explain a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, <laughs> there's basically, I'm just trying to think of drawing a sort of general, general answer to specifically me. Um, but if you were to take our firm, for example, the way our client base work, we then were all sort of separated into various areas in terms of what our main focuses start to be. So, for example, you might have entrepreneurial clients, you might have landed estate clients, you might have international clients. Um, the other category is the vulnerable elderly clients. Um, now that sort of sits at the starting point, but then inevitably there is quite often that sort of crossover between those between those because it's quite common for you know someone to have predominantly landed estates as their wealth, but then you know, within the within the family or for themselves they might also have business interests. So they're this, they're really the sorts of individuals that you're looking at. It's it's incredibly it is very broad, the type of client range, um, and everyone has their own their own contributions, but that sort of then ties back with being, by being multi-service law firm, that's often why we find ourselves, like I was saying, you, know, you might have, within your private world team, you'll have banking input, or you'll have agricultural in, input, and it just, so we're working with lots of different people, which is actually what, for me, I find particularly appealing, is that you're not limited to one type of client, you know, Every client has their own their own journey, their own assets, and their own story within the family. Brilliant, thank you. And um, Alex, kind of from a trainee's um, perspective, 
how involved are you with client communication? How how much contact do you have? Sure, yes. I think um, as sort of Michael and Ed said earlier, when you're a trainee, you're not necessarily having that direct responsibility with the client. So I'm not making the decisions or sort of giving the final advice to the client. Um, but nonetheless, I have found, at least in my experience, that you do get quite a lot of exposure to the clients. You'll be in the meetings with them so you can see how more senior members of your team are sort of conversing with them. And you might be a point of contact for certain clients, um, providing updates or kind of other liaising with the client. Um, so certainly you do get a good level even at trainee, but there's always someone to sort of have that responsibility above you. Perfect, thank you. And then, um, Ed, you mentioned earlier a little bit about kind of um, running around London and, and speaking to clients and things like that. We've, I have a, I had one of the questions and I've just seen that someone else has asked as well, but how, how do you bring in that work? How do you find your clients? Sure, so again, um, we wary of of generalizations because it will de it will depend on the level of the firm and the and the, you know, the the nature of it. But I think most private wealth teams and certainly the private client departments within those, it's not like you see us advertising on television, right? That's not how we our brands don't work that way. Um, we get most of our work through intermediaries, and actually for me, for example, the key intermediaries are usually the private banks I know and the trust companies I know. So other professional service providers basically who have high net wealth clients and those people say to their clients right you need a lawyer for xyz reason i know this guy ed and he'll he'll do a good job for you on these particular um points and so the main way you get work is having really good relationships with those people and having demonstrated to them that you will do a good job for their client because actually they put their name on the line when they say right Ed will do a good job for you. If that client comes to me and then has a really bad experience, not only does that annoy them, you know, in terms of my work, but actually reflects really badly on the person who's recommended me. So you only you get one chart, and you've got to really impress on those things. And so a lot of the job is maintaining um, the relationships with that kind of people. And then once you've got a client, often you get more work from word of mouth from them. So you know they'll refer friends into a position, they'll refer family members, that kind of thing. Say I've got a probate matter where we help pass the wealth on from one generation to the next obviously if you do a good job and the family like you maybe you end up working for the children who've now inherited the wealth so it's a um that phrase of kind of it's who you know i, I think that's that's very very relevant it doesn't you don't have to start knowing those people I and mean, it's one thing really to stress for, for people who are coming into the private wealth sphere um i sound pretty posh but i'm not as posh as my voice probably makes out um you know i cut, went to a state school in essex and i have no connections in this world at all to start with but when you when you get into it you actually start making those connections you don't need to come from a, a kind of wealthy background and, and know a lot of people already but once you're in the job that is a really really key part of getting more senior and getting work in um, and then a little bit of work will come in from things like um, you know when we do training sessions or something I'll go to like a step conference and speak at that and some people might watch that and go oh like actually, yeah, I have a question about that point, and that lawyer clearly knows who he's talking about. I'll get his details and talk to him. But most of the work comes from um, intermediaries. I mean, Michael, is that your experience as well? I imagine it's pretty similar at Wombles. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think um, in intermediaries, without a doubt, one of the most important elements of, of our of our of our work. And um, obviously, if you have your long-standing clients as well for repeat business, but in terms of getting new work, intermediaries definitely the, the main source. I'd say. Actually, that's a really good, I can just jump in there as well. It's a really good point about long-term clients because one thing that, again, is quite different, I think, what we do compared to some teams, at the core of our business is very, very long-term relationships with a number of people that we have worked for over many, many years and who come to us for all sorts of things. You know, we'll do their will, we'll help them move house, we'll help their kid move country, we will help them set up their business, we'll help them you know, structure payments out of that business. Like, we as a firm will cover all sorts of things for them. And again, if you're thinking about why private wealth is a different kind of sector to work in as compared to you know, maybe a corporate M&A or something, which is often a bit more transactional, you do like one thing for a client and then move on to the next one. Um, it is built around, if you're a successful private wealth lawyer, it is built around building long-term relationships with people, both clients and intermediaries. And so you have to enjoy that aspect. Because again, it's one of the things that I 
you know, it's one of my favorite aspects of it but if you don't like that and you want to kind of hide away at a desk and never speak to anyone it's not a good gig for you brilliant thanks you both for that insight um alex just to come back to you um i guess with uh, various areas of law you have kind of peaks and troughs in work depending on what's happening uh, uh, in the industry uh um, as a whole, how would you say, what would your experience be of that in private work? How have you found kind of the predictability of the hours? Um... Yeah, sure. So, so far I've found it um, quite busy. Uh, it's maybe less predictable in litigation, uh, at least from my from my experience so far, because you, you sometimes have sort of court deadlines, which are a lot stricter to adhere to. Um, but then also, I guess, Ed mentioned sort of comparisons with corporate sort of M&A and you might not be faced with those really late nights when you're trying to finish off a deal um, but it's quite hard to sort of pin down exactly the um, the predictability when there is like like we've said such a broad range of different work within the sort of wider private wealth Perfect, thank you. And I think we've we've mentioned a few things that um, the the audience listening should be thinking about if they're considering this type of law or just any law in general. Um, Michael, what are the opportunities to to go international? How often are you working with other jurisdictions? Um, so definitely, the international space is really important. I think for this for this type of work, and I think just to slightly carry up that. Partly it depends on your types of client and partly it depends on where you're working um, in terms of if this is something that will be offered um, as part of the sort of private client service. But even on a really basic level, it's quite common and even more common now than it may have been historically for clients to have some kind of international element, even if it's you know, whether it's a property in another country or shares in another country or just one, one other asset. And immediately there is therefore an international element to that client and a, a something to think about in terms of how they're going to pass on that asset or what they're doing with that asset in terms of their in terms of their family and so what's obviously important to remember is that whilst we can only give uk advice we have to therefore work with other lawyers often in order to give the final sort of adv full advice to the client so it's it's very common to work with other lawyers in other jurisdictions and even if it's purely for you know whether it's passing the client to them for a specific will in that country um, without wanting to get too technical or whether whether it's all just going to be dealt with under under the uk there, 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 there's lots of there are lots of things to think about but yeah absolutely international is something that is, is definitely covered in this area and i'm sure ed would have lots to say on it as well <laughs> Um, yeah, I, yeah I think there is a it's again something to think about if you're looking to come into the area that um, most lawyers who are, most lawyers in the the more advisory side of it so if you take what Alex is doing that's more you know, court based and um, litigation the majority of private wealth lawyers will usually be advisory lawyers not doing things actually in court but you know planning things and helping clients set up structures and, and and put things in place usually trying to avoid going to court frankly that's usually the opposite um result that you're looking for and in terms of what we do um you're often you have to choose a bit between whether you focus on uk side or international i mean we, we have a very clear thing at bird of salmon where our, actually our tax and trust lawyers we have a kind of international unit and the uk unit and there's crossover because, as Michael said, you, know, you can have clients who are pretty much UK through and through, but have a house in France or something. Um, but at the other end of the spectrum, we've got clients like I've got clients who have almost no connection to the UK, but just a little something in the UK, which means they do need UK tax advice. And I sit in the international team here. So the vast majority of my 90% plus of my clients are international in some way, you know, which might be their international. They have family abroad they have assets abroad they have businesses abroad you know, there's, all, there's all sorts of things um and michael was absolutely right when he said that actually it's you know, increasingly that is actually the norm it used to be that was kind of a specialism and now it's hard sometimes to find people above a certain wealth who don't have some kind of international connection but you still have very different specialisms within the teams and so in our tax and trust team you i've got colleagues who are 
real specialists on kind of shooting and landed estates work. And most of that is more UK focused. Whereas I spend a lot of time dealing with, you know, non-domiciled individuals and non-residents. And so if they come across that kind of thing, they'll send it my way. So there is a question when you're going into the area actually to think about, does one aspect of this interest me more than another? Because you don't always have to choose. Some private client teams will not divide formally between those two things, but there will usually be an informal division within those teams where people have, have more experience for a particular kind of working, people have a more experience for another kind. And having a rough idea of where you might want to go just helps you try and steer your career in the right direction. Again, another variable between firms. So really important to find out if you, a firm that you're interested in is doing that type of work. Um, Ed, just sticking with you, you mentioned court, Alex mentioned litigation, you mentioned avoiding court where possible. Someone uh, in the audience has asked, um, do you ever go to court and how does that kind of work in this practice area? So I know you said you tried to avoid it. Um, what what kind of, um, could you just expand on that a little bit? Yeah, of course. So uh, again, very private, if you think of private wealth lawyers, that will include at most firms, for example, trust and estates disputes lawyers who literally spend all their time in court. That's what's what they do. Um, and, you know, my team, um, we have a family team who spend an awful lot of time in court getting agreement to financial um, settlements between parties who are divorcing. So there are some private wealth lawyers who spend a huge amount, if not the majority of their time in court. If you are a classic private client lawyer, someone like myself who does, you know, I advise in tax and I do wills and I draft trusts and that kind of thing. Um, I spend very, very little of my time in court. And even where a case of mine goes to court, it will very rarely be me who is physically in attendance. So we'll have a, you know, we'll hire a barrister, obviously, who will take the case in court itself. But actually, even the solicitors present will usually be our trust disputes team helping that barrister on the day. I'll be kind of, you think of us as the back office, getting things ready, getting things prepared for us, but not usually at the cold face if there's, a, if there's court action. Now, sometimes that differs. I'm due to be in Jersey later this year, potentially giving evidence in a tax case. It explains the Jersey court these are the tax consequences of what you're being asked to do. And again, that's a kind of change in seniority. You, you, you're more likely to do that as you, as you get more senior. But that's still a, um, a rarity, I would say. And so if um, if being in court is something that appeals to you, and if you've been to the Royal Courts of Justice or something and seen the case and you thought, oh, that, that looks really exciting, um, there are aspects of private wealth you can go into that will offer a lot of that. But actually, most aspects of private wealth, you wouldn't be in court yourself, even if some of the matters you work on might end up there in some shape or form. Brilliant, thank you. So worth a, a bit of extra research, um, it sounds like. And then, uh, Alex, um, we've spoken about kind of the different work that you that you get up to. Um, what would you say has been the most desired skill uh, for this particular area of law, the skill that you've, you you found that you've needed to kind of use hone the most? Um, yeah, I think as we've sort of touched on, there is a lot of kind of work with the client relationships within the private wealth um, area of law. So it's good to, if you have strong, you know, interpersonal skills, um, ability to sort of break down complex issues into more simple language for clients, then that's um, that's a really good skill to have for sure. Uh, also, I guess, you know, you're drafting quite complex documents, which can be really important for the individuals involved. So you need to have a strong attention to detail to make sure that you're giving the client what they want ultimately. Perfect, thank you. And um, just conscious of the time, I've managed to get through a fair few um, audience questions, been dropping them in the, here and there. Um, Ed, I wondered if you wanted to just touch on, I know you, you've brought a couple of um, uh, clients and um, cases that you've been working on and you were just going to talk about them in, in um, brief detail. Um, so if you wanted to do that now, that'd be great. Sure. And if you don't mind, before I do, I just, one comment, we chatted about this briefly before the call. I'm very conscious that you've got four men on this, uh, sorry, three men doing the presenting here on, the, on this call um, and probably from similar-ish backgrounds. I think actually one of although we are not representing this particularly well one appeal of private wealth to me has always been that actually on a gender basis at least it's pretty um it is doing better i think than a lot of other areas of law you know if you look at my team there are four partners in my particular unit three of them are female one is male and 
and the one of the female partners in my team is head of the entire private wealth sector at my firm and I think that is not unusual in our area and um, is something that I, I genuinely think makes it a slightly nicer area to work in um, than other bits of um, law sometimes you know it doesn't tend to attract the most kind of testosterone aggressive people usually um, and and again when you're considering areas of law to go into actually do take note of the kind of people you come across if you're kind of on a VAT scheme or something you will find the slightly different personality types in different departments um, and although people change over time there's usually a kind of, there's usually a reason that there's a particular kind of person in a particular team and um, you can get a bit of a vibe as like is that the kind of atmosphere I would like and um, so yeah although we're not doing a great job of demonstrating it today actually I think that is an appeal um, of this era but the, the, the two case studies I, I thought I'd refer to are, are I bought two mainly just to demonstrate the variety of what we do and it's always been a huge attraction for me in the area. Now it's a double-edged sword because the more variety you have in your work the less experience you will have of any given thing you're asked to do on a given day and I think some of you it's, there's a very steep learning curve in um, in private wealth and there's lots of areas of law you can go into where actually you kind of do a variation on the same thing again and again and again and again and again and that means you get really good at it and you kind of do it with your eyes shut and it's great, but maybe it's not as interesting depending on your outlook. We have huge interest, you know, I've come across new things every day that I'm doing. The downside being I spend an awful lot of my time research, even at my level of researching and checking and doing that because actually, you know, even if I've done it before, maybe it was a couple of years ago or three years ago or whatever it was. So um, one thing I've done recently is I've been helping a family set up what's called a disabled persons trust. So they're a couple who are i think probably like early 40s they've got uh, a son who it's become clear sadly he's got quite a few um uh, medical issues they want to make sure that he is well looked after and one thing you can do for that kind of um, in that kind of situation is set up what's called as a, a disabled person's trust where you put a certain amount of wealth into a trust structure and for those on the call who don't deal with kind of private wealth the trust is basically a division between legal ownership of something and control of something which sits with the trustees and beneficial ownership of something i.e having the benefit of it which is with whoever the beneficiaries of the trust are so with a disabled person's trust what that normally means is you have some grown-ups who are often the, the parents or other family members who administer a pot of funds in the interests of someone who for whatever reason might not be able to look after themselves um, in quite the same way and there are various aspects to putting these things in place. There's, you know, thinking about not only how you're gonna look after the individual for whom it's being established, but actually what happens, it's easy to forget them or what happens after, because often you're putting a fair amount of family wealth into trying to support someone. And you've got to remember what's gonna be fair to happen to the balance of these funds after that person no longer needs it. Um, and there are various tax aspects such as these kind of trusts are taxed in a very different way to you know, normal want of a better word trusts and so part of the work is advising the clients to understand well, how do you qualify for those particular um, tax reliefs and a key part of that is that the terms of the trust must ensure that only really the person who, who's meant to benefit can benefit because you, know, you don't want this tax relief trust to be used just to help any family members it's there to help someone who has a specific need and so you you marry up the kind of drafting the trustee with the um, tax benefits and just help them along in that process and obviously it's quite an emotional process as you know, fundamentally we're at stake here is a little boy who needs a lot of help and I think that's a good example of the human side of what we do it, to kind of show that it's not really an extreme range but to show some of the other examples of what we come across last year I was helping a big multinational bank so they were my client, it wasn't an individual, but it was to do with individuals, which is why it came into, kind of came to me. Um, and we were helping a big multinational bank work out what they should ask for in terms of evidence when a client dies, but they have had nothing else in the UK, maybe other than the bank account with this bank, how much should the bank insist on seeing a grant of probate? So for those who aren't familiar with our probate system, when someone dies in the, um, in the UK, if they've got assets here, what normally happens is you go to court, you get a grant, it's called technically a grant of probate or a letter of administration, but a grant of representation, which basically proves that X, Y, Z people are entitled legally to gather in the assets of the deceased person. And that's a way of protecting financial institutions. So if a bank, if a bank sees one of these grants, it can hand over the money 
and not worry about it basically it's covered legally even if it turns out those people were doing something wrong with this the bank should be protected but increasingly you see banks don't want the hassle of insisting on this and actually just kind of want to get rid of the account and close it off and so the values that banks are willing to distribute without seeing grants have gone up and up even in my career and it the risk the bank takes on varies depending on kind of who's asking what the circumstances are you know if basically the deceased was married and they've got a spouse and the spouse is asking for the money as long as they were still living together at the time that's kind of hard to go wrong there but if actually there's a much more complicated position and it's some other family member who's asking you know, you've, you're much more scoped for um getting it wrong and the money ending up with the wrong people so our advice to that bank was all about what risks are you taking on as a bank if you don't demand to see one of these grants and what kind of questions should you ask you know, if you're going to have a form that you give to people who are saying to you i'm the one entitled gathering the money from the deceased what should you be asking of them to minimize that risk i think that's just a useful example of how private as much as we've all been saying you know you work for individuals and structures and things but actually private wealth law is really relevant to big internationals and multinationals as well um, and that can be part of your workload Perfect. Thank you so much. I mean, it sounds like such an, a genuinely interesting practice area. Um, and I um, guess one of the um, things that a lot of our uh, um, audience members will be thinking about is making these applications. Um, one of the, um, someone in the audience has asked Michael, how would you suggest demonstrating your interest for private wealth in an application um, or interview? Um, They've said that obviously surrounding lots of work that a particular firm has done, sometimes a lot of the time cases aren't, aren't publicised in this area of law. So what would be your advice to them? Yeah, that's a very, that's a very good question. I think, I think what's difficult with obviously everyone going through this now, I'm sure I mean, we've all to an extent been through it and now you're, you're going through it and you'll probably find what's really hard is how do you get across in these applications? It's possibly a bit easier in an interview, but how do you get across in an application um, that you have a particular focus or interest in this work, which is presumably maybe a reason which is drawing you to the firm in the first place? I think all I could really say is that if you can, trying to set out something to really support what might draw you to private wealth is, is, is going to be important and so for example like one of the big things we've been talking about with the slight exception of the, the bank example which it, it, we do we do don't only act for individuals but being able to show that you really like working with individuals you're effectively a people person is always going to be a strong a strong thing to get across because that is fundamentally the biggest part of what we do is whether we're not and that's not just clients it's talking with intermediaries um, it's talking with other family members who might act, not act for it. It's so, it's so important. So I think for me, I always think if there's a way to for you or an example that shows that you're good in that in that respect and have those skills, I think that's that's really useful. Um, obviously, if you think there's anything within the actual work that might draw you to wanting to do private wealth, if there's if you can set get that across in your application, that's obviously going to be going to be useful as well whether that whether that's personal experience or just something that's sparked a general interest for whatever reason I think all of those all of those things are, are good good points to get across but yeah for, for me particularly the the personal skills are, are, are important Brilliant. thank you and I think just to add there as well just more generally in terms of applications obviously saying why you're interested in a particular area but also why you're interested in a particular firm um, I think is also very key. So um, that's obviously important to get across as well. Ed, you look like you were about to um, jump in there. So sorry, I think I interrupted you. No, not at all. Um, I was just saying actually one advantage of, because the, the the question I think I mentioned that lots of cases aren't reported in our area, it's absolutely right. Um, but one advantage we do have is that the kind of things we cover are kind of inherently newsworthy. So um, you know, we deal with the, the lives of the rich and famous one of a better phrase and you'll often come across examples of what we do often not portrayed particularly well in the media but you know think back to when you know, jack d and other comedians got done for got done but they like, got found out for being involved in certain tax schemes that may or may not have worked as well as they thought they would 
all those um, film investment schemes that are reported on the news, you know, Nadeem Zaharway and his penalties for using offshore trust. I, I might pop something in here as an example, actually, in the chat, but I wrote an, a, a, a tiny piece recently about the Bernie Eccleston case, where he was, I think, had the largest ever fine from, from HMRC, um, you know, hundreds of millions of pounds. So actually, it is quite easy to find examples of what we do, not necessarily that the firm specifically has done, but of the kind of thing we come across will be in the news quite a lot. And actually, this year, more than any with the election, yeah, there's already been so much coverage of what Labour might do with the non-DOM scheme. Will the Tories get rid of inheritance tax? You know, all these questions. And an area of the of private wealth that's always fascinated me is that it allows me to understand what these debates mean in practice. And what does it mean if we get rid of inheritance tax? You know, how, how unfair is inheritance tax? Is it really a double tax? All these kind of things. Um, and same for, you know, there's a real human element as you most of us will have come across in our own lives some aspect of this and sadly we will have had family members that have died and um yeah, just understanding how that process works you know i found on a personal level it, it sometimes you can give a bit of comfort to friends and family because you can say oh this is what's going to happen in the next few stages and um you know if you want someone to give you a, a quick steer on something you know you can it, there's quite a nice aspect to that um but i think you can you should be able to find things to drop into applications just to mention that I was reading about this and I thought this was really interesting and um, you know I'd love to work in a team that where that was part of what we we did and I actually think that that is somewhat easier in private wealth where this stuff is newsworthy compared to some teams where you might struggle to find a news article that that covers it off if that makes sense. Yeah. No, I, I should and make, I, oh, I was going to very quickly add that just building on that once you in, I, I mentioned there it might be slightly easier to get it across an interview, but once you've found something that has sparked an interest, which may have quite, you know, quite feasibly come from a media outlet or a newsworthy story, you're then able to build on that, re read, read around that, so that you can obviously convey what it is. You know, you, you can build your own views. I, I think that's really important as well. We can't actually Definitely. put. I've just realized we can't chat with everyone, can we? We can't post anything to the to those watching. Um, I think you can, but if um, Ed, you send me the link, we can. Um, it w it, it wasn't important, it around. I don't mean it's not meant to be shouting. My, my, my you know, um, to my own trouble. It was more just an example of you know that case was was, I think, genuinely quite interesting, and and was something that was newsworthy because everyone knows who Bernie Eccleston is, and you know it was a huge amount of money and all this kind of thing, and. Um, what, what I think, if you imagine our, our world as this huge iceberg where this tiny little bit at the top gets into the news with the really famous people, the really big money, but underneath that is all the kind of normal stuff that's happening. It's far less arguably newsworthy and that kind of thing. But um, that little tip that's visible to the public is, is a little hook you can refer to and say, I came across this and you know, I was interested by that. And you know, a big thing at the moment, if you're, if you're talking to firms about private wealth is, the whole move to transparency you know when I even when I started my career is not enormous but when I started it was still possible to have a Swiss bank account and not tell HMRC and HMRC might not find out that was still illegal but it was possible to do it now with increased transparency around the world and this really benefits firms like us and, and the others on this panel because we will always be telling people to do the right thing now they're forced to do the right thing as well as so they have to come to firms like us to deal with it whereas they used to you could previously justify going to someone a bit more shady who might just say oh don't don't mention it you know increased transparency is really important you have jurisdictions report to each other about the bank accounts that you know the other country citizens have in 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 their country um you have things like the register of overseas entities the register of trust like all these things were kind of opening up this previously very secret world that's a big topic and a really interesting just moral question to talk about um and that kind of thing, I think if you're in an interview situation, if you can get onto a subject like that and show that you've thought about it and have a view with some justification, I think that will really impress people. Um, and again, it's, it's a way of demonstrating that this is, a, this is something you, you would have a real interest in. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, and I believe if you go into the chat and put um, change the drop down, you should be able to send the link um, in there. Um, Alex, We've spoken uh, a lot about all the various kind of interesting elements of this um, work. What would you say has been your um, favourite part about um, your seat um, currently? I think, I know it's been covered a lot already, but I, just, I have really enjoyed being able to um, engage with clients that sort of are individuals 
um, and you get a much better sense of the importance of the issue to them than you might if you're working with a sort of large corporate entity. Um, so it feels quite fulfilling. It's quite a fulfilling area of work to be involved in. Perfect, thank you. And off the back of that, I guess, Michael, what um, made private wealth as a practice area attractive um, to you? Someone from the audience has asked that. Um, yeah, another, another good question. Um, what drew me to private wealth? Well, I suppose for me, um, I've said it a lot, obviously, working with individuals was always really big for me. But I guess I'm trying to go back, go back in time now. Um, I think when I did my LPC at the time, one of the electives I did was was was, was private client, which and I knew I I already had a gut feeling I'd have a level of interest in the actual academic side of the of the of the subject. Um, but then that for me was sort of the trigger of building on that. I knew I knew that I also like dealing with numbers as well as as well as as well, which again private client there is that tax side to the work. Um, so they were sort of my initial, like, that was the stimulation side. And then during my training contract, it just became apparent to me that I really, that there was an emotional level to the work um, balanced with the academic side and also just being out and about um, meeting intermediaries, meeting clients, all of those things really are what, you know, for me, meant that, yeah, I could actually, this is what I want to qualify into. and. I mean, one of the other biggest things is I do like to be stimulated at work. And like Ed has said, you know, it's such a broad area. It, it, tax rules for aside, tax rules obviously change. Um, lots, I do lots of rules, but it's keeping, one, keeping on top of what you already know, but then building that knowledge um, and developing and working with other lawyers in other jurisdictions. There's, there's so many elements and angles, um, which is, for me, you know, I, I career can be long and I think having a motivation um, to, to keep going and you know, it's really important. Yeah, thank you so much and I think it just highlights how personal it is as well um, and you like experiencing it is so important to so, like Alex is doing for his seat um, making sure that you're kind of really getting the most out of it and asking those questions and um, getting in, in, involved in the work. Um, we've done really well in terms of getting through um, the audience questions. We've got one here that's um, quite specific um, and I, Ed, I wonder if you might be best placed for this. Um, someone has asked how can uh, one move into private wealth from another practice area? I mostly have property experience but find that, um, find that I'm wanting to change. So obviously um, we've been focusing a lot on kind of applications, so that was the majority of the audience here today, but I wonder if you, if you had any advice um, for that audience number. Yeah, it's so I think there's a there's a reality that most lawyers, the majority of lawyers, will move firm at least once in their career, but will never change their specialism. So the norm is your specialism kind of set from when you when you start. Um, but that is not hard and fast. So it's it's possible but not easy, I think is the way I would summarize this. Um being in property helps because at least you're in a department that does have relevance to private wealth already and there are kind of depending on how keen you are to get into private wealth and what you mean personally by wanting to work in private wealth within lots of firms property departments there'll be a bit that is basically part of the private wealth team already you know we have a high-end residential property team who already sit within private wealth now they do a, they have a very different day-to-day -day experience than i do in a very different kind of work but it is private wealth work if if what you mean is that you'd like to transition into kind of more of the private client side or a different bit of private wealth a lot of it comes down to the structure of your firm so if those teams exist within your firm most firms are open to the idea of someone transitioning from one department to another acknowledging that it's not the easiest transfer and one of the key things i think for you to be clear in your own head if you're going to try and go that route is when you move do you want to start again which is a blow personally because there's just you know the element your peers would have gone up to a certain level they'll be on a certain salary you know treated in a certain way than the firm you can usually if you really want to choose to restart effectively as an nq which makes it easier to progress because you're 
you know, you're back to square one, you're not expected to know anything, and you'll actually usually outperform other NQs because you will, you know, you'll have experience and you'll be that bit more mature and everything like that. But you'll have, you'll take these various hits in terms of salary and, and kind of, you know, status within the firm and things. Or you can try and maintain your status. Let's say you're kind of a two-year qualified, three-year qualified, something like that, who's trying to move across. That's great on one level, you know, you maintain salary, you maintain status, all that kind of thing. But actually then suddenly you're starting and the expectation of you is you've had three years experience in this department, but you won't actually have had that. And it's very difficult to make. I do think private um, wealth and private client in particular is an area where experience counts for so much. And if you don't have the experience, it's very hard to kind of cheat that. Even just you could read the whole of you know some of our most important textbooks are you know, Charles Clark and, and James Castor and people. You could read the whole of those books, and if you haven't actually done it in practice, it would make very little sense to you and be quite abstract. So I think um, being really clear on what area of private wealth you want and what you're willing to trade for that because I do, I do think it will end up being a compromise in some way you're either going to have to compromise where you've got to to date or you're going to have to accept that your rate of learning is going to have to be very very high and you might well have to sacrifice your know, hours and things outside your normal working hours to try and make up for that and then go to the you know the team you're already in I think you want to have quite a good plan before you approach kind of the management in your firm you've got to be careful with not burning bridges because ultimately firms are small places even big firms and your partners will tell the new partners you might work for about you and you want to that to be a really positive message um so you know make sure you explain to them why you're leaving in a way that doesn't make them feel you just don't like them um and then have a really clear idea of how you will get up to speed in the new team and just because I found generally, it's something I've, I now see from a bit of the other side now that I kind of do reviews for lawyers and I sit in on meetings where we're discussing lawyer performance. I think it's very easy when you're more junior to think that management don't care as much about you. Because actually, they, they really do. You'd be amazed at how much time is spent in partner meetings, kind of really thinking about how can we help our juniors and, and support them. But what's really hard is to know what, what will work for those juniors. And actually, I think most law firms, if you go to them with a, I would like this kind of support to help me do this, they'd love to give you that. What's hard is for the law firm to know what you need. And so actually, if you, I think there's a lot of support available if you have an idea of what you might need and how you might use this. But if you expect kind of law firms to just work it out for you and then give it to you on a plate, that's less likely to happen. So um, uh, best of luck is also what I'd say, because I think it is, you know, it, it's, it's tricky, but very doable. Um, and you just need to be clear with where you want to get to and how. Does that Perfect. make sense? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I hope you, that was very helpful. Um, I'm just conscious of time. We've got two minutes. Um, so I'm just going to ask um, each of you now to either um, share a closing bit of advice, perhaps um, a resource that you may have used um, that you think was helpful that you would so recommend to others. Um, so, um, Michael, if we start with you. Um, gosh, clothing bit of advice. <laughs> um, I think I think we've pretty touched on a lot of it already, so I thought it might seem a bit repetitive. But I think being being up to date with current with sort of current hot topics, current news, um, is is really important, particularly if you're looking at applications and then. And then being able to draw on that, whether it's something personal, like personal experience, um, or from reading around and actually just sparking something in your mind, um, to be able to show a genuine interest in why you see yourself wanting to be in this area, um, which which is ultimately then being able to build upon in practice. I'd, I'd say I'd say I'd say that would be would be sort of my closing closing comment. Perfect, thank you. And Alex? Um, I think I would say, kind of based off what we've said today, it's really important to have a think about what you want out of your sort of potential future area of law and how that aligns with what skills you have and what skills you want to develop. Um, so we've talked obviously a lot about being, um, having good sort of interpersonal skills and having lots of contact with clients in this sort of private wealth sphere. Um, so 
I guess, sort of thinking about whether that's that's what you want. And also when it comes to applications, um, you don't necessarily have to only apply past experiences in sort of a legal context when you're trying to promote your own strengths. You can also think about sort of your extracurricular activities and just general sort of life experiences and kind of tailor those experiences to the skills that are appropriate to a certain area. Um, and then sort of using that, that's a good way to build your application, um, not just looking at from like, oh, what prior legal experience, experience do I have? Brilliant, thank you. And we've hit three o'clock, so a quick quick 30 seconds from, from you, Ed. <laughs> uh, do anything you can to get actual experience before you make a final decision. So it's, it's harder now that you speak, so much of it is really structured you know, graduate recruitment programmes, but if you can get work experience at a high street firm or something, or just something where you actually see what it's like day in, day out a bit, I think that's invaluable. Brilliant. Thank you so much, um, everybody, for coming and to, to all of our panellists today for, for their time. Um, I'm just going to hand back to Neve. Thank you very much, Liv. Um, I won't keep you too long. I'm just launching one final poll to get an idea of what you've learned today so that we can share this with our panellists. And before you go, just another reminder to attendees that we will be sending out a link containing the recording to the session. So keep an eye out for that. And a survey will be popping up once you leave this masterclass. So please, please do fill that in because we send that feedback to firms and we also use it to shape what you might like to see in the future. And finally, in our follow-up email from today will be a link to sign up for our next masterclass, which is on legal apprenticeships. Uh, I'm just gonna share the results from this poll. So thank you so much. We're really, really glad to see that you know how to break into this practice area. You know what the work of this, um, these solicitors involves. Until next time, you can find all of our events on the Law Careers Net event page. Thank you so much again to our panelists and goodbye. <laughs>